Please grab your Bible, if you have it with you, and turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Oh, thank you. 1 Timothy chapter 6. We're, we're drawing to the, to the end of this book. Um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. This is not our, our final sermon. I, I always am hesitant to commit to when I'm going to, to finish a book exactly, but uh, the plan is that next week will be the last week in First Timothy. I always laugh that sometimes I'll get into something and realize this really needs to be two sermons. So I reserve the right to do two more, <laughs> two more sermons if necessary. But the, the plan is is one. Uh, and you'll remember that that last week we talked about the the marching orders from the Apostle Paul. Uh, what is he calling Timothy to do as this young pastor? He was to flee to pursue, to fight the good fight, to take hold of eternal life. And then, as our text picks up today, Paul is rooting and grounding those commands, that, that this charge to the young minister, in light of what, what does this charge come in light of? And this is what we see, picking up verse 13. And this is also printed in your order of your worship, if you have it. He says, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of Lord, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we confess that the honor and the eternal dominion is you. We confess that, that we can't see you in your divine essence, but yet we know that we can know you and we can know you truly because you've given us your word. But Lord, we need your spirit today to guide us, to apply this. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that no one would leave the room this morning feeling that this passage of scripture is irrelevant, that this passage of scripture doesn't have anything to say. But I pray that in our different places, whether we need to be encouraged or humbled, uh, whether we need to be uh, strengthened or brought low, that, that you would work your power through this, this text, and you would guide my words. And so we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So in the, in the world of theology, uh, there is a distinction that is made between what are called the communicable attributes of God and the incommunicable attributes of God. And the communicable attributes of God are the, the attributes of God that can be communicated to creatures. It doesn't mean that that's the, those are the only things that can be communicated in speech, but the idea is that God is love, but we can also reflect that love as creatures, that we can be loving. Uh, God is faithful. We can be faithful. And it doesn't mean that we're loving or faithful in the exact same way that God is loving and faithful, but there is an analogy between God's love, God's faithfulness, our love, our faithfulness. But then... We also see in Scripture what are called the incommunicable attributes of God. And, and these are the attributes of God that are unique to God alone, that can't be communicated to mere creatures. That if, if a creature possessed these attributes, they would be God themselves. So you can think of attributes like God being all-powerful, God being outside of time, God being the source of all life. And what we see here in our text are three incommunicable attributes of God. We see God's independence, God's sovereignty, and God's incomprehensibility. And even as I say that, and we'll walk through those individually in a moment, you may feel like those are such big concepts. Those are such abstract concepts that it can feel like looking at the equation of a mathematician on a chalkboard that that, that's, that's irrelevant for my life. That's something I can't wrap my head around. That's something that's not identifiable. How could the 
the independence of God, the sovereignty of God, the incomprehensibility of God be practical, especially when you think of people, as Chris has described, who are facing addiction, who are, are facing profound difficulties in life. Is this just some sort of lofty ivory tower thoughts about God? And what we see in this text is that it's not. That Paul is, is not giving us an abstract theology where he just drops us into the middle of talking about God and his power and his unique power and majesty, but he's, he's rooting and grounding these commands to Timothy. Why is he to persevere, to fight the good fight, to take hold of eternal life? How is he to do this? And it's this charge that is given in light of who God is. And so we see that the attributes of God described here in our text are anything but impractical, anything but irrelevant, but they are actually profoundly life-changing because these attributes that Paul describes strike at the heart of human pride, that they, they humble us. And, and that itself is at the heart of worship, at the heart of the Christian life, is this humility. So let's look at this together. So first, here's the, the first life-changing attribute in our text. God is independent. And look in your Bible again at verse 13. He says, I charge you in the presence of God... Who gives life to all things? And then down in verse 16, he says that God alone has immortality. And of course, God in having life, that, that, that is communicable. God is alive. We are alive. But for God to be the one who gives life to all things put his, puts him in a category that is completely other from a mere creature because Everything else in all of creation is dependent, that we are dependent on God for life, for, for existence. But it says that, that God is the one who gives life to all things, that he is the, the independent one who pours out life to his creation. Or when it says that he alone has immortality, it's not saying that as we trust in Christ that we can not experience eternal life. But it's saying that true immortality, to have life in oneself, that is unique to God alone. That, that God isn't dependent on anything outside of himself. God isn't dependent on some abstract idea of love to be love. That, that God is love. He's not dependent on some abstract idea of goodness. That he is goodness. He's not dependent on our worship. He's not dependent on our praise. That God is completely and utterly sufficient and independent in himself apart from his creation. That if God had chosen to not create anything, to exist only in himself for all of creation, that he would not have been lacking, his glory would not have been lacking, uh, there would have been no need. But yet God, in his power, creates, he gives life, that everything else is dependent on God, that we are dependent on God. And you say, well, what, is that, what does that look like? How do we see this dependence? And I think that we can see an analogy of this dependence even as we think about the food that we have in our refrigerator at home. If you have any produce in your refrigerator at home, that you, you think of how that got there, that the sun had to shine on the plant so that it would grow. The Rain had to fall, the, the farmer had to tend the ground, the truck had to transport it to the grocery store, and someone had to, to sell it, to organize it, to package it. So you had to have a, a job to know, in order to have the money to buy it, or somebody had to give you that food. That, that just to have that food shows the level of dependence, that the number of steps that went into just having food in our refrigerator, or food in our, on our table, or food in our stomach, that that we're not independent creatures, that we are profoundly dependent on others. And we see it, of course, in the sun, but the sun, S-U-N, is itself dependent on the sun, S-O-N, that the sun says in Scripture, the Son of God holds all of creation together, that he created all things, he sustains all things, that that not only is creation dependent on God in coming into existence, but 
According to scripture, the, the creation depends on God for its continued existence, that if God took away his hand of providence, that the whole universe would come unraveled, that we are profoundly dependent on an independent God. And this is why the Apostle Paul, when he was speaking to the elite, educated Athenians in Acts 17, says this in verse 24. He says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by human hands. In other words, our idols are dependent on us for their existence. We make the idols. We carve the idols. But he says that the, the true God is, doesn't live in, in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives life to all mankind. He gives life and breath. And everything. And so he is dependent on no one. He doesn't rely on our praise, on our temples, but he is the one who gives life and breath to all mankind, to all things. And that's why Louis Burkhoff in his systematic theology says that as the self existent God, one who exists in himself as the great I am, he is not only independent in himself but also causes everything to depend on him, that everything depends on God. And so as you think about this independence of God, you see how this strikes at the very heart of human pride. I was listening to a, a podcast this week that, that was speaking about this theme, and of course I, I, my ears perked up because I, I knew that I was going to be talking about this independence and, and he said, how does it make you feel to know that you are completely dependent? And I think that often that, that doesn't make us feel good, that we want to think that we are independent, that we can sustain ourselves, that we can, we can be an island in ourselves, that we ourselves can be a city on a hill. But he says that, no, we are, we are dependent creatures. So this strikes at the pride of atheism that says we are independent of a God, that there is no God. This strikes at the, the pride of pantheism that says that everything is God, that we're part of God. Because we see that it's not that all things are God or that the universe is somehow this eternal God, but that yet God is the one who gives life to all things, that God alone has immortality in himself. So so there's this a, a profound distinction between the creator and the creature, that we are creature, God alone is creator. But then this also strikes at our individualism, that, that our, our culture says that as individuals we are independent in ourselves. And if we're not independent in ourselves, that that at least should be the goal. That's what we should strive for is independence. But as I, as I said, we are dependent whether we want to face it or not. And in the same podcast, uh, one of the, the speakers made the point that our belly buttons are a testimony to our, our dependence. That you, every time you, you look at your belly button, you remember, I am a dependent being. That there was a time when you were completely dependent on your mother and then even as an infant, you are completely dependent on your parent or your, your caregiver. But then you, you think of, of how dependent you were, that you didn't choose to come into existence. You came into existence. You didn't choose to have the honor and, and the dignity as image bearer that Chris spoke about. You didn't choose where you would be born. You didn't choose to whom you would be born. You didn't choose what language you would initially grow up speaking, you didn't choose your DNA, you didn't choose your hair color, you didn't choose your skin color, you didn't choose your eye color, you didn't choose your name initially. I mean, later someone can change their name, but initially we don't choose our name because we are dependent. And then throughout your life, you remain dependent. Yes, hopefully when you're 30, you're not as dependent as you were when you were six months, uh, but yet in reality, you are still interdependent. You still depend on others. You, can't, you didn't mine the metals that are in your phone. You didn't probably grow most of the food that you eat. 
you didn't make the power that you use in your house. You didn't build your car. You didn't found the business you work for. Maybe you did, but, uh, but you probably didn't do every single aspect of the business that you founded. That we are dependent. We, and behind it all is the independent God, the only one who is not dependent. That all of creation itself is dependent on the Lord. That, and that's humbling. And that's where we should be in that place of humility and dependence on God. And it's in that humility, that, that pride-shattering humility of dependence that we actually come to worship. That we are here worshiping, we're here studying the Bible because we are dependent. And, and that worship is this ultimate statement of dependence. We worship saying, Lord, I am not independent. I can't make it on my own. I can't make myself or preserve myself. I can't save myself, especially when it comes to salvation. That's why heaven is a free gift and it's not earned or deserved because we're sinners and we can't save ourselves. That, that, that it's a, a, a a free gift at its root because we are dependent not only for our first birth, but for our new birth. To be born again is the work of God, that we are dependent on him for everything. So we say with verse 16, to him be honor and eternal dominion, amen, that we worship the God of creation, of providence, of redemption. And so that's then the, the first life-changing attribute of God in our text, that God is independent. But then here's the, the second life-changing attribute we see in our text, that God is sovereign. So look at verse 15. He says, God is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And there again, at first you think, well, maybe this is a communicable attribute of God because we can be kings, but we're just not kings in the the same way that God is, is king. Maybe there's truth to that. But when it says that he is the blessed and only sovereign, it's saying that, that in himself, that he is the one who truly rules, who truly directs, that he is the one who, who directs all things according to the counsel of his will, that he is the one who upholds everything in his power and his will and his purposes, that it's not our purposes that stand for history. It's not us who direct the course of history. It's, and it's not that chance or just natural forces are directing history, that there is a, an only sovereign who is directing the course of your life, the course of my life, the course of events that we face, that, that we see the sovereign God. And that's why in Deuteronomy 10, 17, we read that the Lord, your God, is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God. Or in Revelation 17, 14, we read language that's almost identical to what we see in our text from 1 Timothy, that God is Lord of lords and King of kings. And so you can think about just the, the judicial system in America that, that we, we think about the Supreme Court of our nation, that if you're in the judicial system and you appeal a decision, it can go to a higher court, and eventually it might work its way up to the Supreme Court. But if the, if the Supreme Court rules against you, there's no higher court of appeal in our nation. That basically seems to settle it in our judicial system. But what we see here is that, that it's not the, the highest court in the universe. It may be the highest court in the land, but that above any human authority is the only sovereign, is the king of kings and lord of lords. And that's why this attribute of God also strikes at human pride. Because we often think about reflecting on our sin, striking at pride, that is, we think about how we fall short of the glory of God. But isn't it interesting that, that another way to humble ourselves is not just to think about our sin, but to think about the greatness and the sovereignty of God. And as we think about God as the, as the king, it, it shatters the pride of despotism. You think despotism, the, the despot, the, the ruler who claims to be the ultimate authority. And this text says no, that, that the, the king, as much authority as he may claim in himself, that he is not the final authority. He can't claim to be the only 
sovereign because the Lord alone is Lord of our life. So this strikes at despotism, but it also strikes at the pride of statism. You say, well, what is statism? And and that's the idea that the state itself is ultimate. So it may not be the, the leader, the king, the dictator who is ultimate, but the state itself is what determines reality, that there's no higher authority than the state. And if you've read George Orwell's 1984, you know that's the claim that the state made in that uh, dystopian novel, that, that the state claimed to be the, the measure of history, that the state is the highest authority, that the state can determine history, that, that what is the past? If, if there is no God, then no one remembers it. It's gone out of existence. And, and so does it have any real existence? And the state decides what is real. But what we see in scripture is that that authority can't be claimed by any state uh, because the Lord is the highest authority. He is the only sovereign. He is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And so this strikes at despotism, at statism, but it also strikes at our individualism. And I mentioned already this individualism of our culture because in our American society, we say we, we don't believe in a king. We overthrew or we didn't overthrow the king, we broke away from the king. Uh, we hopefully move away from statism of seeing that the state is ultimate because even our system of government has put limitations on the authority of the, of the state. But then you, what we say is that the individual is ultimate, that the individual is king, that you are the king of your life, you are the lord of your life, you are the only sovereign of your life, that you get to decide who you are, you get to define your identity, and that no one can tell you otherwise than you decide within yourself. But what we see here is that you are not the king of your life, that you are not the Lord of your life, you are not the only sovereign of your life, that that as a dependent being, that you owe your praise and your honor to the Lord, that, that he is the one who is is to direct your life, that that he is the one you are to serve and to admit your complete and utter dependence upon him as his subject with him being the sovereign king. That, and, and you can think about that even in just the details of your life. When something goes wrong in your life, it's not that God is the author of evil. Scripture is very clear on that. But yet we're also told in Scripture that God works all things together for good, that that what happens in your life isn't an accident. It's not happening outside of the the sovereignty of God. And so you can trust the even the what seems like bad luck coming into your life, that God is his sovereign, that he's a he's directing that, that in his power, he can direct all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose which means that the best things in your life, according to the sovereignty of God, can work for the glory of God, and the worst things in your life can work together for good as well. And so then we we look at the King of kings and Lord of lords, the only sovereign. We admit we are not the sovereign, and the only response is humility that flows into worship, that we join verse 16 and say, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And we do what we sang in holy, 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 that is that the the throne room of God and the the heavenly hosts cast their crowns before the king. And they cried, holy, 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 Lord God almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. That even the, the glorious heavenly hosts bow down in reverence and awe before the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the only sovereign. So that's then the the second attribute we see in our text here, that God is the only sovereign. But then here's the third and the final attribute, that God is incomprehensible. And even as I say that, I found the words of a man named David Haynes helpful. He says that to say that God is incomprehensible is not to say that we can't we can know nothing about God, but rather that because He is infinite, no creature can ever come to comprehend, understand, grasp, or describe God in a manner that is worthy, adequate, or all-encompassing. Or Louis Burkhoff in his systematic theology says that the Christian church confesses 
on the one hand, that God is the incomprehensible one, but also on the other hand, that he can be known and that knowledge of him is an absolute requisite unto salvation. And so you see what that's saying, that, that God is knowable, that God has revealed himself in his word. But even as we say that God is knowable, immediately we have to say that, that he is not fully comprehensible, that we can't imagine what it would be to be outside of time. We can't imagine what it would be to be outside of space. We can't imagine what it would be to, to be a God with such mighty power that he could speak all things into existence out of nothing, that, that we can't comprehend the essence because we are finite creatures. We can't even begin to wrap our minds around the reality of God, the God who, who isn't composed of all sorts of different parts that you could dissect God and examine the parts, but that God who, who isn't dependent on anything outside of himself. And that's why in verse 16 of our text, if you look there in the Bible, Paul professes this truth about God. He says that God dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To think of that God who is light, and in him there is no darkness at all, that the God who spoke all things, who said in the beginning, let there be light, who dwells in unapproachable light, that, that as a child you're always told, don't look at the sun, it'll be bad for your eyes, but it's saying that, that God in his glory dwells in this incomprehensible light whom no one has ever seen. And you can think of Moses, when he wanted to see God, to see the glory of God, God told him, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. That God is spirit, it says, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That we see his power, his majesty, his works, we hear his word, but they saw no form. And this is why we also read in Isaiah chapter 55, where God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Can you wrap your minds around the infinite? Remember, that was what God told Job at the end of of that book, when Job had been trying to figure out the mystery of his suffering, God proclaimed his incomprehensibility. Where, O Job, were you when I fashioned the earth? Where were you when I spoke everything into existence? Where were you when I laid up the, the snow in the sky? That, that, that there is so much mystery that we can't begin to comprehend. And so then this strikes at the vital of our human pride that we want to think that we can define God. We want a God that we can understand. We want a God who is just like us. We want a God that, that has our, our own limitations. We want a God that where, where we can probe into who he is self-sufficiently, independently, and discover who he is apart from his revelation. But what we see is this dependence, that we are dependent on the revelation of God to know him. That what we know is true, but it's not everything because God is infinite, but yet we can know him truly. And so this strikes at the pride of rationalism. Rationalism that said we can rationally understand and wrap our minds around everything. We can't. We can't fully understand. Our human minds are so limited. And this strikes at the pride of even the theological systems like Mormonism, where Mormonism says that God was once a man and that we can become gods ourselves, that we can someday inherit our own universe. But this says no, that, and, and even it says that God has a physical form, a physical body. But it's saying no, that, that God dwells in inapproachable light whom no one can ever see, that we, we don't bring God down to our level, but we recognize him and his majesty and his, that he is spirit. He's God, uh, eternal, outside of time, full of power and majesty. And so this, of course, then, as I said, not only strikes at rationalism, it strikes at our individualism, that, that we cannot in ourselves understand that we need the scripture, we need 
God's revelation. And from that place, the only response to this is, is worship, to declare with verse 16, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. But then you say, well, wait a second, Will. You're, you, you're, you're proclaiming this, this God who is, who is independent, who is the only sovereign, who is incomprehensible. But how can we know this God? You said that he's knowable. How do you actually come to know this God, to be brought into relationship with this God, to, to know his love and his care and his faithfulness for you? And this is where first, where John chapter 1, verse 18 is so helpful. It, it says, no one has ever seen God. He dwells in the unapproachable light. The one and only Son, who is himself God and is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. And so how does the incomprehensible God become known? And it comes in the person of Christ that Jesus comes as truly God, truly God in all of his incomprehensible might, his incomprehensible sovereignty, his incomprehensible power, that that God doesn't give up being God, but in Christ, he takes on himself a true human nature, a true human nature that was dependent, a true human nature that, that had a belly button, that, that Jesus had a belly button, that he had a sign of dependence. That's the only thing you're going to remember from this sermon. Um, but, but he came in dependence. That's what we see even in the, the Christmas story where, where he comes born in a stable, this, this helpless babe in the form of man, truly God and, and truly man. And that's why Paul, in verse 13 of our, of our text, he says, I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, that we are to live in light of this God, this independent, sovereign, majestic God who is King of kings, Lord of lords, who is incomprehensible to our human reasoning. But yet in Christ, in, in his humbling himself, Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, died a sacrificial death on the cross, taking our sins in that moment so that we can be forgiven. And he rose from the dead into glory, ascended into heaven. And it says in verse 14 that we then live in, seek to live in obedience and faithfulness to the Lord until his appearing, that we look to the appearing of Jesus Christ. And that when someday he comes again in glory to judge the living and the dead, that that we shall see him in his, his divine majesty and his independence and his sovereignty and his incomprehensibility coming in the clouds. But then we'll also see him in his love and his, his mercy and his goodness and his, his faithfulness to all those who look to him for salvation, all of those who find life in Jesus Christ. And, and then we bow down and, and worship. We say to him be honor and eternal dominion forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are dependent. We stand before you as, as those who are not sufficient. We are not the only sovereign. Our minds are, are so limited. We, we under, misunderstand so much. Even those with a, the highest IQ in the world can't begin to comprehend the weight of the infinite, the, the weight of glory that is to be revealed. But yet, Father, we, we thank you that though Moses had to veil his face because of the glory that was fading away, that, that in Christ that we can behold your glory, Father, with unveiled faces as we are transformed from one degree of glory to another, that, that in Christ we can revel in the incomprehensible, that we can rejoice in our dependence, that we are dependent on you, Father, the God who loves us. And so, Father, we, we pray that we can find this dependence on you and that this dependence would overflow in us fighting the good fight, that would, of us taking hold of eternal life, that of us 
striving in Christ, fleeing what is wrong, pursuing what is good. And that, Lord, as we worship you, that we wouldn't claim anything in ourselves, but we look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who made the good profession and is coming again in glory. We pray in his name. Amen.